Well, my friends, we've taken time addressing violent dangers, revealing difficult truths, and even breaking down the nature of reality itself. But today, I felt like it's high time we added a more friendly page to our list of stories and creatures. Today, we'll analyze a monster that became our world's most faithful companion, and even became as close as family. Gather around, my friends, as we come together to understand the Chocobo. We'll begin with the Chocobo's known history, as it's much more ancient than many people understand. No one knows when the races of Eorzea first began training and interacting with Chocobos, but these events happened before any kind of written history was conceived. The earliest depictions of people interacting with chocobos are actually cave paintings that were located within the mountains near Ishgard. These paintings are so old they could date back to the second or even first astral era. In fact, there are some scholars that theorize that the first interactions with chocobos happened in the forgotten timeline between the Sundering and the first Umbral Calamity, the Calamity of Wind. But since all of this happened prehistory, we can only create theories and well-educated guesses as to when this happened. While we may not know exactly when these first interactions occurred, we do know that the early races saw the chocobo's potential as a beast of burden. The aforementioned cave paintings depict the chocobos transporting people, goods, and even helping to till the soil. So even before written history, chocobos have been assisting us in more ways than one. Since then, chocobos have only become more and more regular to many Eorzean civilizations across its thousands of years of history, with most countries making use of chocobos in one way or another. Yet, with all that history, from where did the first chocobo que? These days, most domesticated chocobos hailing from Eorzea come from the regions of Curthus and Dravania. This seems to be because chocobos prefer densely wooded terrain over grasslands. However, while this might be where we acquire our modern chocobos, evidence suggests that Curthus and Dravania aren't where they're originally from. Research into migration patterns have proposed that original chocobos might actually have come from the wooded areas hidden in the many valleys that decorate Abalathia's spine. In fact, it's rumored that these purely wild chocobos have continued to exist in these hidden chocobo forests for thousands of years. As for the distribution of accessible wild chocobos in the modern era, their migration across the three great continents has been strange. While natural migration is suggested to be the root cause of the chocobos leaving Eorzea, it's just as likely that domesticated chocobos were brought into Ilsebard and Othard by caravans before losing their handlers and returning to their wild ways. Mayhaps it's a combination of both, as both theories would explain why a race of Eorzean birds would be found running around in southwest Othard. Now that we've gotten their history and potential origins out of the way, let us move on to their biology. Like their long-legged appearance suggests, chocobos are powerful runners and can reach amazing speeds on land. Their legs are so strong, they're known to deliver kicks that can bend or even destroy armor. As for their wings, despite many domesticated chocobos losing their ability to fly, it's more common to see wild chocobos with their wings large and powerful enough to achieve flight regularly. As such, chocobos are listed as cloudkin, sharing the same classification as griffins, zoo, and other aerial creatures. A chocobo's diet is surprisingly diverse, with many different forms of fruit and vegetation on the menu. But their favorite food by far are known as gissel greens. While gissel greens are seen as a weed by most farmers, chocobos adore this plant, and it's become a cornerstone in their diet. Like other cloudkin, chocobos can be observed possessing more than one color. While most chocobos are of the yellow variety, they've been known to naturally appear in shades of black, blue, and even red. Many people are under the impression that a chocobo's color is indicative of their personality or aggressive nature, but this is mostly untrue. When properly riled up, all chocobos can be aggressive and dangerous. 
But it appears this rumor began when a group of adventurers were beset and mauled by a large red chocobo over and over again. Neither their skills or their weapons could save them. And so that brings us to ask how a chocobo could beat seasoned adventurers in the first place. The answer is surprisingly simple. One of the things that distinguishes chocobos from many other creatures is their intelligence. When compared to other beasts, chocobos are incredibly smart. They've shown an understanding in the use of tools, basic magic, and even display an understanding of object permanence. These birds are increasingly clever and have been seen outwitting would-be hunters on more than one occasion, proving that they have a good memory as well. Not only do they understand commands once trained, it suggested that they comprehend the primary language being spoken around them when given enough time. And yet, despite their higher than average intelligence, there's one other thing that chocobos are well known for. Their smell. Chocobos are notoriously smelly, with wild chocobos being detectable by their scent long before you see them. This is assumed to be a natural warning mechanism, as wild chocobos can become highly aggressive when threatened, and they are not against ganging up on and killing would-be predators. Domesticated chocobos, while still maintaining that natural musk, can have that scent lessened greatly by a good diet and regular grooming. However, this is why most chocobos are forbidden from being brought into major cities as a strong enough scent is known to make those with weaker constitutions dizzy, or even nauseous. But a lessened smell isn't the only benefit domesticated chocobos have over their wild brothers and sisters. Thanks to selective breeding and diet control, domestic chocobos now come in a small variety of sizes. Normally, the natural variations of a chocobo's size is broad enough that they can be ridden by races like the Hyur, Makote, or Elzin with relative ease. However, average chocobos prove to struggle under the weight of Rogadin, or are much too large for people like the Lalafell. So after many controlled generations of offspring, domestic chocobos now come in a small variety of sizes ranging from the Belladia Jeanette, which is small enough for a Lalafell to use, to the massive Draft Chocobos, which are large enough to comfortably carry two people. And yet, even with all of this out of the way, many of the traits we've discussed have been noticed in other creatures. Although, there is something that was found to be unique to the Chocobos themselves. They have a dramatic sense of community, or more specifically, their idea of family. Wild chocobos are rarely, if ever, seen as loners. It's much more common to find chocobos traveling in large flocks, as they're known to thrive when in the company of others, and become extremely stressed if isolated and left alone for extended periods of time. They develop emotional attachments to other chocobos easily, making them extremely protective of one another in the wild. But these familial bonds were not lost when they became domesticated. Quite the opposite. Instead of forming strong bonds with only chocobos, these connections were extended to include their handlers, trainers, and owners. It's very common for chocobos to see the people they're raised or trained by as family. And as such, they display the same protective tendencies and levels of affection to those people. This has been singled out as likely being the biggest reason why chocobos have become so important to Eorzean societies, and how they were among the first creatures to be domesticated. They don't just do as they're told because they know they'll get food or treats from their handlers. They often do things because they understand whatever love they give, it will be returned, strengthening that familial connection. Some chocobos have even been observed behaving like brothers or sisters to the people they've been traveling a long time with. It's likely that chocobos don't see these connections as a master-pet relationship, and instead observe these bonds as a partnership. As such, many chocobos throughout history have been eager to run into battle alongside their chosen partners as that wild protective instinct kicks in allowing them to fight many monsters head-to-head. -head. 
Now that we're finishing up, we'll go over a few popular myths and stories involving the chocobos since they've more than a few tall tales associated with them. The most common stories are those involving what we know as the fat chocobo. There have been multiple sightings in history, but no one knows exactly how they come about. They're usually just there, and will sit wherever they please, moving barely an elm unless provided a reason to move via food. There are even some stories of fat chocobos talking with the common tongue, but despite having never been proven, this has made some chocobo enthusiasts insist that the big yellow birds need to be moved into the spoken category instead of cloudkin. Another popular story is that chocobos have their own spell school. Although this isn't completely true given that it's not uncommon for many monsters to use some form of magic as an offensive or defensive tool. Although, due to a chocobo's higher intelligence, it has been proven that they know when and where to place certain spells to get the most out of them. And while not technically a studied spell school, these incantations are lovingly referred to as things like Choco Cure and Choco Meteor. Lastly, it's believed that all chocobos have lost their ability to fly due to domestication. This is simply not true. While domestication has certainly decreased the number of chocobos that are able to fly by a large margin, there is a percent of them that can reacquire this talent with the right training. These flyer chocobos are rarer and seen as a boon to any who possess them. And that, my friends, will bring an end to the analysis of our favorite feathered friends. Chocobos have been around so long that a lot of this knowledge isn't even taught. It's simply accepted as being part of Eorzean culture. Which is understandable. The existence of chocobos goes back further than most forms of known history, making much about what we know about them very mysterious, even in the present day. And yet, despite the veil of mystery leaving much of what we know to theory, chocobos are celebrated all the same. From pets to partners, soldiers, and even professional racers, these birds have placed themselves in almost every part of modern Eorzean society. It's almost as if they can tell how much they're loved, and are happy to return that affection in whatever way they can. Make no mistake, despite being classified as cloudkin, Many cultures see chocobos as people, so you'd be wise to treat these birds with the same respect you give anyone else. And who knows, if you treat them well enough, they might just consider you a part of their family as well. As for me, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. If you yourself possess a chocobo, make sure to give it a treat today. But that will be enough from me for now. So until next we meet, stay safe my friends. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Big shout out to my patrons, Rovakis, Monsolo97, Potato, Runeteer, The Yellow Couch, Papaya, Cyan, Sage Mouse, and Volvalisoma. If you want to see more lore content in the future, share this with your friends. My dream is to share as much as I find with as many people as possible. And if you do end up helping me, thank you so much in advance. And have a wonderful day.